this video, we will discuss the importance of correction factors in auditory brainstem response testing. We will be looking at the origin and derivation of ABR correction factors, as well as how these correction factors can be implemented into clinical practice. We'll look at some case study examples and explore what happens if we don't use these correction factors. First of all, why do these correction factors matter? When performing auditory brainstem response testing, it's important to remember that the ABR is generated only as high as the brainstem, whereas our pure tone audiogram results or behavioral thresholds are generated much further up the pathway into cortical and consciousness regions where a decision is made to respond to the stimulus. So what we need is a way of relating the ABR results to this pure tone audiogram or these behavioral thresholds. We need to convert our ABR results into something that resembles and relates to the pure tone audiogram more closely. This is called the ABR offset. Now evoke potential systems are calibrated to adult data, but more often than not evoke potential testing, particularly the ABR, is used on babies. If we are testing babies, we need a way of converting the calibrated ABR stimulus into something that more closely relates to these infants. Our babies also grow very rapidly, and we'll talk more about how we need to account for that later. Evoke potential systems should be calibrated using the correct electrical peak equivalent sound pressure level calibration of the transducer. The RET spell values are then applied in order to convert the physical PESPL into NHL, which is a hearing sensitivity related scale. RET spell values are provided by the ISO standard 389-6. The CE chirp family of stimulus, which is found on the eclipse, is not yet included in this standard, but there are independent studies which have been published on the CE chirp family, which detail the RET spell values and this conversion. Evoke potential systems should present stimuli levels in NHL. Historically, there have been some unusual scales used, so it's important to check that the NHL is the value presented by the system. We then apply a correction factor to get from NHL to EHL. This is as close to HL as we can get. We can't say that this is HL because that is reserved for pure tone audiometry. Hence, in ABR, we use EHL, estimated hearing level. Furthermore, we have different stimuli that we use for ABR testing. We have CE chirps and the frequency specific family. There are also tone bursts, also known as tone pips. And again, there are frequency specific versions of these tone bursts. We also have clicks. These stimuli are all different to each other and they're different to the pure tones that we use in pure tone audiometry. And such, they will have a different effect on the babies that we are testing and that needs to be accounted for. So, what correction factors do we have available? Well, if we go beyond the evoke potential system itself, a step further down the line is the transducers that are used to deliver stimuli to our babies. And these different transducers each need their own correction factors because they deliver that stimuli in different ways. Many people refer to the British Society of Audiology Guidelines. This is a freely available document which has comprehensive correction factors available for ABR testing. These are provided by transducer and in age brackets, and we'll talk about those in more detail later on. It's really important to note that you must add these correction factors to the NHL values. You'll see that some are positive numbers and some are negative numbers. Remember, we are adding this correction factor value to our NHL number in order to get EHL values. So if you add a positive number, you simply add it. But if you add a negative number, you actually subtract it. Here we can see the correction factors for inserts. And you'll notice there are different stimuli here too. Next up, we can have a look at the correction factors for headphones, and we'll go into more detail about why there is limited age brackets here later. And we can see that there are correction factors for bone conduction values as well. One thing I'd like to draw your attention to at this point is that there are different values for different stimuli, tone bips or bursts, and clicks and chirps. 
We'll go into this in more detail later, but for now it's important to be aware that the chirp category has been based on data using the CE chirp. There are other chirps available and it is important to be aware that these may perform differently or have different ret spell values. You'll notice that the document says combined correction factors. Let's go on to have a look at what goes into making these values. So where do these ABR correction factors come from? Firstly, let's consider the ABR offset. There have been many studies over the years investigating the relationship between ABR results and pure tone audiogram or behavioral thresholds. Fortunately for us, Stapels in 2000 published a meta-analysis, and this included 32 studies and over 1,200 participants. Some of these participants were adults and some were children. Some of them had normal hearing and some participants had a hearing loss. So we have a really comprehensive meta-analysis here. There was a wide variation found between the results of these individual studies, and there are a few contributory factors to bear in mind as to why this was. Firstly, there is a variation in the methods of ABR stimulus calibration. The duration of the ABR test time varied across the studies. The definition of ABR threshold also varied, and there's also a variability in the nature and calibration of the behavioral measure to which the ABR threshold is compared. So let's take a look at the data that was derived from the Stapel's meta-analysis. The BSA correction factors were derived from this data with the following assumptions. They used adult data in preference to pediatric data from this analysis as the measure of the behavioral threshold being pure tone audiogram in adults was likely to be more consistent across the individual studies. And no correction was applied for the difference between the ABR threshold in adults and babies. The reason for this is that it wasn't possible to find sufficiently consistent data in the literature. The BSA paper uses a definition of threshold as the lowest clear response. An estimated correction of 5 dB has been applied on the basis that much of the published data were likely to have been gathered under ideal test conditions, and threshold in some studies is likely to have been defined with a less strict criterion than the lowest clear response. The equivalent figures proposed in the Ontario Newborn Hearing Screening Program from Hyde in 2008, which are also used in the DSL hearing aid prescription technique, are also shown here. The only difference is 5 dB at 2 kHz. So after considering various factors, the authors of the BSA paper reached a provisional decision to opt for the same figures as the Ontario program, which uses insert earphones. Adding the Ontario correction leads us to these values for our ABR offset. It is only 2 kHz that changes because of the additional 5 dB. The figure for click ABR has been based on the fact that the click ABR is a larger response and tends to have a slightly better threshold than the 4 kHz tone burst ABR response. The offsets for chirps are based on a study in normal babies at 1 and 4 kHz, and this study was by Inga Firm, Guy Lightfoot and John Stevens in 2013. This study involved a direct comparison of tone pip and CE chirp ABR responses. Their results showed that larger waveform amplitudes and therefore greater signal to noise ratios were found using CE chirp stimuli than using tone pips. And as a result, the authors proposed that the ABR offset for narrowband chirp ABR should be 5 dB less than that for tone burst ABR. The values for narrowband chirps in the tables are therefore all 5 dB less than the equivalent tone pip values. Remember, these values are based on CE chirp stimuli, so caution should be used if testing with other types of chirp stimuli. So that's our ABR offset, but what about the different ages of our babies? And what about the different transducers that we can use? Let's consider insert earphones. Now, insert earphones can give higher levels of sound in the smaller neonatal ear canal, and there have been some studies that investigated this. Voss and Herman in 2005 performed a modeling study and they found an effect that varied by frequency of around 5 to 8 dB. Sininger et al in 1997 measured sound in the ear canal and they found a higher level in neonates than in adults for the four main frequencies. And this varied across the four frequencies. Clicks were 20 dB greater. 
Marcoux in 2011 found values of 2, 6 and 7 dB at 0.5, 2 and 4 kHz for the difference between infant and adults by looking at the real ear to coupler differences in stimulus level. So correction factors were decided upon based on these studies. The mean of the three studies at 4 kHz was 14 dB. However, the Sininger study differed quite considerably from the other two studies, so the other two were given greater weight, resulting in the choice of 10 dB. These are the correction factors for inserts for under 12 weeks of age. A fixed value is used for this age band. The literature data showed too much intersubject variability to deduce a trend within this band. Over 12 weeks, correction factors are likely to reduce with age, so there was a decision taken to approximate a gradual reduction in two steps, firstly at 12 weeks, and secondly at 24 weeks. There are no correction factors over the age of two years for insert earphones. So what about bone conduction? The bone conduction stimulus is calibrated on data derived from a group of normally hearing adults. Sites should check that equipment has been calibrated to these values. Once again, we have an ISO standard that should be used in this calibration process. The need for bone conduction correction factors comes about because of the difference in head size. An adult head being larger means that the bone conduction stimulus disperses over the greater mass than a baby. A baby's head is a smaller mass, and so we can use the assumption that the same bone conduction stimulus is effectively stronger when applied to a baby, owing to the smaller mass that the bone vibrator needs to stimulate. A correction therefore needs to be applied, which is dependent on the age at which the baby is tested. Again, we can start with our under 12 week old age band. Now these values for 0.5 and 1 kilohertz came from another paper by Fern, Lightfoot and Stevens in 2013. The 2 kilohertz values came from a combination of papers, including Van der Werf et al. in 2009, Fox and Stapels in 1993, and Small and Stapels in 2008. All of these studies applied weighting and stimulus correction in the same fashion as was found in the firm Lightfoot and Stevens paper that we used for 0.5 and 1 kilohertz. The 4 kilohertz data also came from that same Small and Stapel's paper in 2008, and also from Cohn Wesson and Ramirez in 1997. Again, they applied the same weighting as they did for 2 kilohertz, so all very consistent papers with each other. Over 12 weeks of age, the bone conduction stimulus correction is retained for all frequencies, but there is a reduction of 5 dB. This is based on evidence from the Small and Stapel's paper in 2008 that showed a continued presence of bone conduction stimulus lift above the age of 12 weeks. There is some evidence, again, from the Small and Stapel's paper that a BC stimulus correction value should be applied for babies between the corrected age of 24 weeks and 2 years. The reduction in the correction is continued, with values being adjusted by a further 5 dB, unless the value was already at zero, as in the case of 2 kHz. And there is no bone conduction stimulus correction over the age of two years. Click bone conduction correction factors are derived from the difference between air conduction and bone conduction click ABR thresholds in babies with normal air conduction click ABR thresholds. This was reported by Webb and Stevens in 1993. This was rounded to the nearest 1 dB, which explains the numbers on the graph in front of us. So what about headphones? When it comes to headphones, we have two different styles. Supraoral, which you can see on the screen now. These sit over the ears. We also have circumoral headphones, which fully enclose the ear sitting around it. It is important that we differentiate between inserts and headphones because, and this is the case for both supraoral and circumoral headphones, the relatively large volume of air within the cuff of the headphone dominates the acoustic load that these earphones must drive and the differences in sound pressure generated in infant and adult ears are generally smaller than those with the insert earphone, in which the changes in ear canal dimensions have a bigger effect on the load that the earphone must drive. It turns out, in fact, that while there are correction factors required for inserts, which we've already talked about, 
none are required for headphones. Voss and Herman found that circumoral and supraoral earphones produce changes between infant and adult ears that are less than 3 dB at all frequencies. So this was deemed insignificant for the purposes of correction factors in the BSA paper. So we have our ABR offset, our transducer corrections, and these are divided up into different age groups. The authors of the BSA correction factors paper brought these together, so let's look at how this works. Let's take just one example. In this case, we've used insert earphones, CE chirp stimulus, testing a six week old, and we've used four kilohertz. So firstly, we need our ABR offset. And this is the data that comes from the Stapel's meta-analysis, plus the 5 dB. For 4 kHz, this gives us an ABR offset of minus 10. There was no correction to align with Ontario. And as we are looking at a chirp, we end up with an ABR offset of minus 5. Next, we need to consider our transducer correction factors. In this case, we used insert earphones, and we're looking at the 4 kHz range as that was the stimulus used in this example. These are divided by age, so we need to make sure that we select the correct age band. We are dealing with a six week old, so that's the under 84 day category. And that gives us a correction factor of plus 10 for inserts for this age group for 4 kHz. So we have an ABR offset of minus five and an insert age related correction of plus 10. When we combine those together, minus five plus 10 gives us a correction factor of five. And here we go. Our combined correction factor document gives us that combined value. Let's consider another example. In this case, we're testing a 13 week old using supraoral headphones and testing one kilohertz CE chirp. So first of all, again, we need our ABR offset and that comes from the Stapel's data. We're looking at the one kilohertz column, that's this one here, and we are testing a chirp. So our ABR chirp offset for one kilohertz is minus 10. Next, we need to consider the effect of the transducers that we've used. In this case, it's the supraoral headphones. Now you'll remember from earlier that we don't have a correction for the stimulus level of the headphones. And so this means that the headphone data is not divided up into different age bands. In the combined correction factor document that the BSA have produced simply lists the ABR offsets under the headphones section. And here, because we are dealing with the chirp at one kilohertz, we can see that that correction factor of minus 10 matches the ABR offset for chirps at one kilohertz. So we've looked at how we get to our final combined correction factors. Now I want to show you some examples of how we apply these correction factors in clinical practice. First of all, we need our combined correction factor document. And this is the good news. You don't have to calculate the ABR offset and the transducer age related combinations. This document has done it all for you. So all you need to do is apply these correction values to your NHL value. First of all, we need to know some information about our baby. So in this case, we've tested a four week old who was born at 38 weeks gestation. That makes them two weeks corrected. And we've been testing using CE chirps. When we tested using insert earphones, we recorded an NHL threshold of 45 dB. Because there was a hearing loss present there, we've also tested 4 kHz bone conduction threshold, and we've managed to record down to less than or equals to 10 dB NHL. This means we recorded a response at 10 dB NHL, but we did not go any lower. Now to turn the NHL into EHL, we need the right correction factor. So first of all, let's think about the insert earphones and we'll zoom in on the inserts correction factors. It's really important that we select the right correction factor from this table. And remember, we are adding these values to the NHL thresholds. That means if it's a positive number, we add it. If it's a minus number, it's essentially a subtraction. So we're looking at the inserts. That's good. We're in the right place. We're dealing with the chirp. So we're on that side. Four kilohertz is the frequency that we've tested. And we know our baby comes under the 12 week age band. That all brings us to a correction factor of plus five. 
So we're going to add that plus 5 to our 45 dB NHL, which gives us a correct threshold of 50 dB EHL. Next up, let's have a look at the bone conduction because we've got a hearing loss. We need to find out whether this hearing loss is sensory neural, mixed or conductive. Let's find the correction factor for this one. We zoom in on our bone conduction values. We're in the right part of the document. We're still dealing with chirps. We're still dealing with four kilohertz and the baby's age hasn't changed, still under 12 weeks. So that brings us to a correction factor of plus five again here. Let's pop that over here into our calculation. So we are adding plus five to that 10 dB NHL value. That gives us a corrected threshold of less than or equals to 15 dB EHL. So these EHL values are the ones that you would use to describe the hearing loss, make your diagnosis, explain it to the parents, fit hearing aids if that's what you decide to do, and decide on management plans based on those corrected values, not the uncorrected NHL values. Let's have a look at another example. Here we have a 15 week old. They were born at 38 weeks gestation, which means they are 13 weeks corrected. Again, we've tested them using a CE chirp. Here we've used headphones, however, and we've tested two kilohertz, giving us a threshold at equals to 65 dB NHL. Now again, we've got a hearing loss, so of course we've gone on to test our bone conduction threshold at the same frequency, and this gave us a value of 45 dB NHL for our threshold. So we need to find our correction factor. Let's zoom in on the headphones part of this document. Now we are in the right area for headphones. We are testing chirps, so we're on that side of the column. We're testing two kilohertz, very important to select the right frequency. And for headphones, we don't have those age-related correction factors. All of the ages are combined here. This all gives us a correction factor of minus five for the air conduction in this case. So what we need to do now is add our correction factor to our NHL. Because we have a minus number, it's essentially a subtraction. So 65 dB minus 5 dB gives us a corrected threshold of 60 dB EHL. Don't forget we've got to calculate the same for our bone conduction threshold. So let's find the correction factor that we need to apply here. We zoom in on our bone conduction section. We're in the right place. We're still testing CE chirps. We're still testing two kilohertz. And this is where the age becomes relevant. It didn't matter for the headphones, but for the bone conduction, the values are divided by different age bands. So because our baby is 13 weeks corrected, they come into the 13 to 24 weeks age band. This gives us a combined correction factor of minus five again. So we need to put that into our calculation. Now we've got 45 dB NHL. We need to add our minus five correction factor. That is essentially a subtraction, which gives us a corrected threshold of 40 dB EHL. And once again, we have 16 dB EHL for our air conduction and 40 dB EHL for our bone conduction. Those EHL values are the ones that you would use to describe the hearing loss, explain it, make a diagnosis and decide on a management plan. It's also what you would use to fit the hearing aids. There is another way of calculating ABR corrected thresholds that I'd like to show you. This Excel document is a masking calculator, which is available for free from the ERA training website. Although it's designed for calculating masking levels, it also has the added benefit of having correction factors included in the calculator. So we can, we can ignore the world of masking for now and just use it to work out our corrected threshold. But we do need to tell this masking calculator some important information to get the right data out of it. Let's take a case of a nine week old baby they were born at 39 weeks gestation, which means they are eight weeks corrected. And we've tested them using CE chirps. We've tested using one kilohertz insert earphones and found a threshold of 55 dB NHL. Because that was a hearing loss, we've gone on to perform bone conduction testing, also at one kilohertz, and found a threshold of 40 dB NHL. So the beauty of the masking calculator is you don't actually need to think about the correction factors. It just tells you the corrected threshold. 
we do need to make sure we have the right information in the masking calculator, which at the moment we don't have. Now, I think the corrected age is right, but all of the other elements need changing. The important ones to think about are the stimulus transducer, the stimulus type, the corrected age of the patient, and we need to tell it the right NHL stimulus level. So let's change those values. Here we can see now that we've got inserts, which is what we used for testing. We've got our one kilohertz CE chirp, which is what we use for testing. We have the corrected age of six to eight weeks. That hasn't changed, but it's always good to check that it's right. And we've input our threshold of 55 dB NHL. This gives us on the right hand side, a corrected threshold of 50 dB EHL. So there's no need to even think about the correction factor. The masking calculator simply delivers the corrected threshold. We still have to do our bone conduction because we've got a hearing loss. And again, at the moment, it could be either mixed or sensory neural. So let's work out the corrected threshold here. We've got most of the data right in the masking calculator, but we need to change the transducer to bone conduction and we need to input the right NHL threshold. So let's put the right data in, that's better. We can see that we've got bone conduction. We're using the one kilohertz CE chirp. The age hasn't changed. And we've input our stimulus level of 40 dB NHL for our threshold. This gives us a corrected threshold of 50 dB EHL. So we have a corrected threshold of 50 dB EHL for inserts and the same for bone conduction at one kilohertz. This tells me that we have a sensory neural hearing loss in this baby, and we can now go on to explain these EHL values to the parents and program a hearing aid accurately based on those data points. Let's have a look at another example using the masking calculator again. In this case, we have a three week old who was born at 41 weeks gestation. That makes them four weeks corrected. And we've tested using a CE chirp. In this case, we're going to look at 500 Hertz using the insert earphone. The threshold that was recorded here was 50 dB NHL. Because that's a hearing loss, we've obviously gone on to perform our bone conduction testing at the same frequency. And we found a threshold of 30 dB NHL. So to find our corrected threshold for inserts, let's check what data we have in the masking calculator. We don't have the right information at the moment. Again, remember, we need to make sure the stimulus transducer is right. The stimulus type is correct. The corrected age is appropriate. And we need to put in the NHL stimulus level of the threshold that we want to correct. Let's change all of that. And I think this looks a bit better. We can see that we've got our insert earphone in place. We've selected 500 Hertz. We've got our corrected age is appropriate. And we put our 50 dB NHL threshold into here. This gives us a corrected threshold of 40 dB EHL. But we still have our bone conduction to do. So let's make sure that we find the right corrected threshold here. Once again, it's important to change the data in the calculator. We need to make sure that we are on to bone conduction. We're still using a 500 Hertz CE chirp. The patient's age is the right one. And we've put in our stimulus level of 30 dB NHL. This gives us a corrected threshold of 40 dB EHL. So we have the same corrected threshold for our air conduction and our bone conduction, once again telling us that we have a sensory neural hearing loss. And this EHL data is what we can use to explain, diagnose and formulate a management plan. So next up is something of a cautionary tale. I'd like to use some more examples to highlight the consequences of not applying correction factors to ABR thresholds. Let's have a look at this case. Here we have the three week old baby that was born at 41 weeks gestation, four weeks corrected and tested using a CE chirp. At 500 Hertz, insert earphone threshold was recorded as equals to 50 dB NHL and bone conduction threshold at the same frequency was equal to 30 dB NHL. So this is the uncorrected NHL value. Let's have a look at this on an audiogram. So this is showing me that we have some kind of mixed component to the hearing loss. The bone conduction is raised, but the air conduction is raised even further. 
Immediately, my thought process here is, do we need to perform some kind of middle ear testing like tympanometry? Do we need to do some investigations to find out the cause of this conductive component? Is it likely to fluctuate? Could it get worse? Could it get better? Does it need some kind of intervention to try and improve it and try and alleviate that conductive component to improve the hearing back to the best possible bone conduction thresholds? However, we know that we need to apply correction factors. So if we do that, we have a corrected threshold uh, for the insert earphones of 40 dB EHL and the same for the bone conduction. So if we put that onto our audiogram, we can see the blue and red is our corrected thresholds and the gray symbols represent the uncorrected NHL thresholds. Having applied those correction factors, we immediately change the picture of this baby's hearing loss quite considerably. Now we're no longer looking at a conductive mixed component, we're looking at a sensory neural hearing loss at this 500 Hz region. I'm now not thinking about investigations into the conductive component or whether there's some kind of surgical management required. I'm thinking more along the lines of this baby has a, a significant sensory neural permanent hearing loss and do we need to consider hearing aid provision? Obviously, this would depend on the results of testing at the other frequencies, but by applying those correction factors, we instantly change the picture and we now have a completely different thought process as to the appropriate management for this patient. Let's have a look at another example. This baby is four weeks old. They were born at 38 weeks gestation, which makes them two weeks corrected. We've tested using four kilohertz insert earphone CE chirps, and the threshold that was recorded there was 20 dB NHL. Now, if we assume a normal hearing range of 20 dB, if we put this uncorrected value onto the audiogram, we can see that it falls within the normal range. So if we were to make our diagnosis and our decision based on this uncorrected NHL value, we might be considering discharging this baby on the basis that they have normal hearing. However, if we apply a correction factor, we actually have a corrected threshold of 25 dB EHL. That may seem like a small change, but we know that that takes us outside of the normal range of hearing. This baby's diagnosis now officially becomes a mild hearing loss at 4 kHz. Obviously, I would now want to be considering testing other frequencies to particularly investigate whether there is some kind of reverse sloping hearing loss. And I would also be wanting to explore bone conduction testing to find out whether this hearing loss is sensory neural or conductive. The importance of applying correction factors can really be seen in this example, because if we hadn't applied them, we may have discharged a child, a baby, with a hearing loss, having told their parents and diagnosed them with normal hearing incorrectly. What we don't want to do is miss a hearing loss that needs investigation, support and monitoring as the baby gets older. But what if this four week old was actually a bit older? What if they were 24 weeks old? That makes them 22 weeks corrected. But say we still have the same results. We've tested four kilohertz CE chirp using insert earphones and recorded a threshold of 20 dB NHL. This is still the uncorrected value. And if we look at it on the audiogram, we can see that as with the previous case, our 20 dB NHL still would be guiding us towards normal hearing. In the previous case, the correction factor moved the actual EHL value into a hearing loss region. But in this case, because the baby is that much older, they enter into a different age band of correction factors. And their corrected threshold actually comes out to 20 dB EHL because there is no correction factor. The correction factor for this combination is zero. So we can put that onto our audiogram and see that our audiogram remains unchanged. So in this case, a 24 week old with the same result as a four week old on the NHL uncorrected value actually has normal hearing, whereas the four week old presented with a hearing loss. So really important note that we must use the right correction factors for different cases. Those age bands can make a significant difference. And in this case, the difference between discharging them with normal hearing and diagnosing them potentially with a hearing loss, depending on the age that we were considering. So the final example I'd like to show you is that of a 16 week old who was born at 42 weeks gestation. This makes them 18 weeks corrected. 
And in this case, we've managed to test quite a few different frequencies. We've tested 500 Hertz, 1 kilohertz, and 4 kilohertz CE chirps using insert earphones. And the thresholds that we've recorded were 50 dB NHL for 500 Hertz, 45 dB NHL for 1 kilohertz, and 55 dB NHL for 4 kilohertz. Now these are the uncorrected ABR thresholds, so let's have a look at how that looks on the audiogram. Now here you can see that we have essentially a moderate flattish hearing loss that is bilateral and symmetrical. In this case, we would obviously be wanting to consider hearing aid provision for this baby, but we know that we actually ought to be applying our ABR correction factors. So if we do that, let's have a look at what the thresholds turn out to be like. Now for 500 Hertz, we change from 50 dB NHL to 35 dB EHL. For one kilohertz, the 45 dB NHL uncorrected threshold corrects to 35 dB EHL. For four kilohertz, our corrected threshold stays the same at 55 dB EHL. Let's have a look at this on the audiogram. Now here we can see the blue and red represent the corrected ABR thresholds, and in grey we can see the uncorrected NHL thresholds. And this to me is quite a significant difference. If we were to fit hearing aids to this baby based on the uncorrected NHL values, we would possibly be risking overexposing them to noise and causing some loudness discomfort. But furthermore, particularly given the configuration of their hearing loss, the extra sound, the extra amplification provided at 501 kilohertz would provide quite a lot of masking for the 4 kilohertz region and would prevent access to those all important high frequency speech sounds. When you look at how much extra amplification would be required for the uncorrected NHL thresholds compared to the corrected EHL values, there's quite a significant difference. And remember, this is a very young baby. It's going to be quite some time before they're able to self-report or give any indication about loudness discomfort or poor quality of sound. The most important thing for these babies is that they learn their speech and language. And in order for that to take place appropriately, they must have the best access to speech sounds, particularly those high frequency sounds in the four kilohertz region. So hopefully this example gives you an idea of how important it is that we do use our ABR correction factors to find the correct thresholds that we use to program hearing aids, make our diagnosis and inform parents about the situation regarding their baby's hearing.